I think we just all went into complete shock. During the surgery, um, there was some blood loss, but they were monitoring it, they thought, and in the end, um, there was too much blood loss, and her heart stopped, and they weren't able to get her revived again. He basically went into some water that had a very strong current, and he lost his grip, and the water took him. And somebody invited him to go on a, a sailboat in between um, Amsterdam in Holland and Harwich, which is in southern England. His boat basically just never arrived. So we're left with a lot of questions as to what happened still. When I got the news, I can't really put into words what kind of like level of devastation it was. In my mind, I just couldn't accept the fact that she had passed away until I saw her body. So they did take me to see her. And then it hit me. She was still warm. And when I touched her, I just couldn't believe it. While my dad's still on the phone, my sister's helping me with my mom, who's pretty much out of control at this point. And then I look at my dad and I see something in his face that I've never seen before. It was this, it was like life just left his face. And it was this a point of sadness that I've never seen on him. And when I saw it, I got really scared. Originally, we'd been told that he 80% chance that, that he was alive and he'd be found. There was just some small mishap that had happened. And then gradually we were down, you know, 60, 40, 20. And then there was really no hope that he was alive. And at that point, I think shock, just complete numbness set in. I wanted to be alone in my grief. I didn't seem to want to have anyone around me. and. Uh, I am, I live alone. So I headed home and once I got home, it started, the, the complete breakdown, the tears, I couldn't stop them. I had the shakes, I was cold, I got into bed and, and I just shook and cried. I don't know how he died, why he died. I don't believe what they're telling me. I'm so tired. People keep coming in. I can barely see because my eye, I'm breaking down all the time. Where I just, I can't do anything except cry. And seeing my parents like in such bad shape, it doesn't, it's so hard to see that. My mom probably was the most fragile of all of us. She's not, not the healthiest person to begin with, and this just devastated her. She had a hard time getting up, carrying on with everyday activities. Gradually that came back, and I think with it, some of her healing came. As she, actually, she was able to care for me as, as sort of a child who'd come home, and she still, she still had me. And so she was, uh, she was an excellent support to me in that regard, and, and hopefully vice versa. <laughs> I don't know. Um, my father really, um, he's a traditional man. He didn't believe in showing grief. Certainly he'd been pretty adamant that we wouldn't cry or show emotion publicly during either of the memorial services for Chris. And and that pretty much carried on. He felt that, I, th I think he felt he was so close to breaking apart himself 
that if you saw somebody else do it, that would be the end. The question you get more than anything else is, how are you, how are you doing? You don't even want to answer that. You don't want to talk to them. What do you want me to say to you? You can't. Most people there, thank God, didn't understand what I was going through. A lot of my friends, a lot of my brother's friends would come through the house. I was friends with most of my brother's friends. It was good to see them because they were people that could relate to my brother better than my own friends could. And they were close to me, so I loved it. I was happy that they were there, but I hated the how are you doing question because, you know, I could either lie to you or I could cry because I can't talk. Don't ask me this right now. I don't like the question. And that question is a stupid question. Some of our closest family friends as well, I guess as they say, they, they, it wasn't that they weren't there, but they didn't want to listen. They didn't actually want to engage with it. And so they would come and bustle around and leave very quickly. And it was almost like a whirlwind, whirlwind coming through our lives as opposed to bringing the peace and security and stability we'd wanted. The funeral itself was difficult. Um, it was uh, something that I guess for me it was especially difficult because six months before Shirley died, um, our mother had passed away. And this was bringing back memories of Shirley and I being there for our mother's funeral. And I didn't realize that six months after burying my mother that I would be burying my sister. My mom, she didn't get better. She was pretty much bedridden. She couldn't get out of bed ever. She spent all day in there and she cried literally all day. You know, we take turns trying to help my mom. Seeing her in that much pain just adds to the pain that we're in. At the end, after the service at the grave, I was the last to leave. And I didn't want to leave. I felt I was leaving her behind. But uh, of course, one had to go. So I um, again was invited to go back with everyone to meet with some people at the house who were from out of town that were coming, but I really didn't want to do that, so I didn't. And I just said I needed to be alone. But I think that's me as a person. I just wanted to grieve by myself. My, my relationship with my parents has changed pretty dramatically since Chris's death. Um, I think my mom particularly, it's, it's affected her greatly. She's lost actually two kids now and, and, and I'm the one that's left. And, and she gets very scared for me. Where my family is now since my brother died is it's an interesting place. My mom has more fear than I wish she would towards me. She doesn't want me to do anything. Oh, they're just maternal instincts. She, she doesn't like it when I do things like snowboard. Anything where there is any risk whatsoever. And it, I, I try hard to understand that. I know where she's coming from, but at the same time, I can't just stop living, if, if anything, for my brother. He, that would destroy him if he knew that I stopped living when he died. In my mind, they're kind of excessively afraid for me sometimes. And, um, and they have to let me go because I have to live my own life. And in, on the same hand, I can't make it all okay for them. I, they have to find their own friends and I don't think you can ever fill the gap of, of the loss of Chris. But but you can find new experiences that you might not have had. Maybe search out new friendship groups to, to fulfill some of those social, social support needs that you now have. 
So I guess I'd say we're a lot closer and we look after each other a lot more. But at the same point, it's something that we were continually negotiating. If my mom, dad, and my sister went somewhere and they're a couple hours late, now the worst scenario runs through my head. And I feel so uncomfortable because I think, what would I do if I lost them? And it puts me in an even worse place because, I mean, I lost my brother. I know what it feels like. But if I lost the rest of them, I don't think I could live through it. That's how I feel about it. I need them. And I, hope, I think they know that. I don't express it as much as I like to. But I try to. It just, it's hard to express the words that I, I felt inside. That it, that I guess I wasn't alone. Because after the loss of my parents and Shirley, I felt I was very alone. I, in the sense that I had lost my immediate family. But Janelle and Lindsay and Ken kept saying, you know, that we're, we're together, we are family, and you know, we are going to be there for each other. So that means a lot to me. Anger, I feel a lot of anger, and I, sometimes I think I've really gotten control of that. And sometimes it springs up. I, I was saying that um, this last, this has been the sixth anniversary of his death, and oh, I felt the anger again. <laughs> um, I feel angry that he depended on people, and, and they let him down. That he went into life and into an experience trusting that nothing could go wrong. And that really it was human error and, and a bit of chance that almost seemed to have conspired against him. I can remember this distinctly waking up in the middle of the night about a week after he'd gone missing and thinking that he was, he was, or he had been calling for me and that he'd been hoping that I would be there and that I'd come and maybe even believing that we would, even though Realistically, there, there was no way we could have changed the event. I have felt a lot of guilt thinking that he, he was waiting for me and I didn't come and that somehow, I don't know, telepathically I should have known. Because um, frankly, I didn't have any sign that, he was, I, that there was something wrong. I, I had no inkling. I was going along pretty happy in my life. And the news of his disappearance came as a complete shock. So when this happened, I wasn't angry, but I wanted to blame God to some level because, you know, everyone's saying this is God's will, they want the better people, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to be angry at him. I, I don't lose faith. I still think he, I know he's there, but I don't want to be angry with him. So I'm using all my faith and power not to hate God for taking my brother. I do feel some anger at, at Chris himself because he, he's left behind so much distress. I, I know he never would have intended it and I know that, that wherever he is, I'm sure he, you know, he's walking that with us in terms of the pain that we still feel and the, the loneliness for him and um, the sadness. But sometimes I feel angry, why did he have to go on that boat? Why did he always have to be so adventurous? Why, when I needed him, wasn't he there? Because I, I really needed him to actually understand and deal with his death. I mean, it's sort of just this crazy experience that you, just when you need the person who, who means that much to you. The advice that I'd give to somebody who's, uh, who's recently lost a, a brother, um, I think it would be to, to be very gentle with yourself. Um, not to minimize the experience or the loss that you've had, because certainly there's a lot of 
focus on parents' loss, and and it's a tremendous loss to parents, no doubt about it. But the loss of a sibling, that, that person you've grown up with who has shared all those little things in life that you have, that, that loss is, is profound. With people that knew him, I like to talk about him. I'm fortunate that one of his best friends is my neighbor, and she's a big talker. She loves to talk, so it's easy to talk to her about it, and she's right there to talk, and that helps. In, in my case, I think we had some people come by and sort of suggest that I needed to slow down, and in a very quiet, in a very gentle way, but in a way that, that made me stop and think. There's no shortcuts that you, I feel you have to grieve, you have to let the pain, you have to go where the pain is, not to ignore your feelings or perhaps you might think, oh, I'm not gonna think about that or look at her picture because it brings too much pain. And I found that is the way you heal, is by going and facing the pain and the grief and letting it come out. I think another thing we found really helpful were resource books. And I think the reading and the books out there were a way that we could each uniquely find a, a different approach to understanding grief. My father had to go to the philosophical understandings of grief. Um, mine were mostly stories is what helped me. And then my mom seemed to get into more of the spiritual. I feel that you have to be there for one another. You know, life is short on this earth, so if you can find the good in every day and to realize how lucky you are to be here and don't waste it, don't waste your time. I hope I don't forget Jamie. I don't think I will. I made a little scrapbook, not for anybody else, just for me, that I want to look at whenever I feel like it. It's full of pictures, it's full of words, it's full of letters, it's just for me. I don't want to forget them. I don't think I will. In terms of feeling connected to Chris, there has been a big shift. In the first, I'd say even the first two years, I could hear his voice. I still remembered his expressions and, um, you know, you could still actually smell the, you know, the, <laughs> well, he was an athlete, let me say, uh, <laughs> his, his clothes didn't always smell sweet, <laughs> but, um, there was a lot of tangibles that were still there that we could rely on. And with time, those, those do go. I, I can't hear his voice the way I used to. I have dreams about him. I love it when I have dreams about him. I don't, they usually don't make sense. I don't care if he's in it, that's great. Sometimes it's realistic, like he just shows up and I'm going, God, where have you been? I knew you weren't dead. I can picture him in my mind and certainly he comes to me in my dreams sometimes, but some of it's a little shady, you know, it's, it's getting a little shady around the edges. I can't quite picture him. I do talk to Shirley. I, both in my head and out loud. Um, sometimes uh, there's a situation going on and I'll say, Shirley, I need your help here. I guess I believe that it's, she's there with me as well as my parents. Um, coming today, I was talking to Shirley and my parents and I was asking them to give me the strength to do this. I feel her presence, her spirit is with me. I'm curious what's gonna happen when I'm 30. I hope I'm still dreaming about him, 
is he still going to be 24 while I'm 30? I don't know what's going to happen. I just have to wait. I really hope I keep dreaming about him. So what I've, what I've done recently, and I guess the, the strategies I have, is I try to do activities that we love doing together and really going out and searching for them. Um, my, my husband and I have started doing adventure racing. So we would go off to the mountains and do these really long trail runs and kayaks. And I just know that although he, he wasn't there, or he, you know, he was never actually there with us, it's something he would have wanted to do and he's there in spirit. And I feel really connected to him when I do it. I had a dream once that I went sailing with him. I like to sail. My brother never has. And I know he would love it. And in my dream, I took him sailing. And that made me feel so good when I woke up. Just feel as though I did take him sailing. And he loved it. So I don't want those things to stop, ever.